All right, good to go. All right, um, so this small presentation is just like one project that we had at Cox where um, there's a, a group of users that like they wanted to um, make their TFTP and HTTP download for the cable model firmware a little more easier, right? Uh, today they have uh, servers in each market and uh, these cable modems, I mean, it's mostly you know, for uh, cable um, MSOs, uh, but then the, uh, they were actually giving specific IPs to go and download uh, specific firmwares from inside the market. Uh, one of the things is that uh, there was a project that came up that required to upgrade um, cable modems. Uh, they, were, they wanted to do 20,000 a day, and uh, with the current infrastructure that they had, they couldn't do it. Uh, so the uh, the cable lately actually supports HTTP for the firmware download. So they actually wanted to leverage this, although their uh, servers or uh, or the bandwidth that they use for the servers didn't support that capability. Uh, so once they um, actually I'm going to move this here, um, they reached out to us like, hey, can we leverage the CDN since the CDN you know speaks HTTP uh, to do this task? And you know, I said, well, of course we can do that. Um, so what happened is like, well, we had to stand up an origin server just to test. And once we started testing, we realized uh, a few things. But um, I'm going to go here. The problem that they had is like, you know, well, they wanted to start using HTTP right? and also um, been able to put the files in a single location so they don't need to rsync all the servers. Uh, the benefits here would be that they're going to have faster download with HTTP over TFTP due to the ancient protocol in UDP. Uh, it's more reliable download as well. and so, all right, the central location. And uh, of course, if we could actually provide them TFTP capability, then they can actually um, decommission the existing server that they got. So yeah, leveraging the CDN. So we had a few challenges. Um, one here is that the cable ones don't support DNS. So the CDN, I mean, without DNS, actually yeah. doesn't quite work, right? Yeah. So the first thing that we had. Um, the second thing is that they actually reuse the IPs in every market. For example, the temp space, they would actually reuse the same IP address in each of the market. Because they have private IPs? Exactly. Yeah. Private IPs, and they're not backbone routable. So for example, if I've got a customer in Phoenix, well, they can't go and download, like in Vegas, for example, for the next cash group if something happens. And uh, of course, because of all this, then we can't actually use request routing. You know, either, I'm sure they don't even support 302 redirect, but you know, they can't do DNS as well. So uh, as is, I mean, the CDN just doesn't work. So and also, it needs to be present in every single market. Although we have a good, you know, coverage for a CDN, it's not in every single market, at least at Cox. So now we're talking about it. If we want to leverage the CDN, then we had to build a CDN extension, and we had a few requirements here. Um, we wanted to use a single IP address, so leverage any guest. And we wanted this to work with IP and IPv6. IPv6 is not working today, but we got an IPv4. They wanted to keep the support for TFTP. And of course, the CDN doesn't support TFTP. And uh, something that we wanted, it's like, well, if we're actually building a service, then we want to leverage traffic monitor to monitor these, um, these VMs that we're actually going to bring up to, for that services. And our mid caches are kind of locked down on specific subnet IPs. It's not that we can't work around this, but we wanted to if we're actually installing an extension, then we want this to be a third uh, tier to the CDN. And of course, the presence in each market and caching is desired, but it's not required here. So um, this is what I came up with, right? So it's a fairly easy thing. So what we're talking about this here, you see like this open stack thing. That means that Cox now has a cloud. Uh, built an open stack, and we have v or we have capabilities in each market to bring up VMs, and this is what we kind of use. So basically, if we have 18 markets, we brought up like 18 VMs, like one in each market, which we actually connected to any cast on one side or a single IP, um, and then the other side would actually reach out to the CDN. So we used a few components here. Um, you'll see HA proxy is the thing I wanted to use at the beginning just uh, for testing. This is what we're currently using. So if the cable modem actually requests HTTP through the this endcast IP, a single IP, it needs uh, it will actually uh, reach out to HA proxy. And if I actually request a TFTP uh, file download to that same endcast IP, well, we have this small uh, proxy that says the TFTP to HTTP translation. That's something 
no, this is something else, something, somebody wrote this. So there's actually a C version and a Golang version that's available in GitHub. I tested both, they both work, right? Um, but I picked out the Golang version just because. Um, but this is, uh, so it's on each VM, we actually have uh, these, um, these processes that run, HA proxy and also TFTP to HTTP. But basically the HA proxy, I'll show a configuration layer, uh, later, but it does just proxy to an edge, um, uh, an edge delivery service. And I wanted this, so it actually just reached out to the CDN. And whenever, the, if a market goes down, for example, it would just like pick up the next market. So it does leverage DNS uh, reverse proxy. And uh, we see here there's a, we have Grove in here. Right? And that's my first attempt to test traffic control or traffic Grove. And um, at first I thought it would work well, right? We actually leverage it for a traffic monitor because if we actually define in traffic ops uh, that these servers are actually an edge, right? Then Grove does give us the ASTATS capability to report back. So we actually using traffic monitor today to uh, monitor these VMs, but the only thing that Grove does is provides the status that the VM is alive or not. It doesn't provide any of the statistics right now. And I'll explain later a little why it's there. It could give you like bandwidth and stuff, though, right? So it does give me bandwidth. So the two stats, yeah, it's alive, right? It's reported, like it's it's not down or connection. something, and it gives me bandwidth. Connection. Uh, it should give me connection as well, yeah. But I mean, we don't monitor it actively, except that it's it's offline or not. And of course, it will monitor if TFTP is available or the HA proxy. So we're actually running Grove on port 8080, uh, and HA proxy is running on 80. But yeah, and and of course, we're running Telegraph on these boxes. We're running Filebeat for you know logging capabilities. So this is basically the you know the design, and uh, it, it's actually working fairly well. Uh, the only problem that we came across. Well, there's a few problems we came across. HA proxy, the one that's actually available from CentOS, is version 1.5. It, it does support reverse proxy to DNS, but when it boots up, it picks up the A record, and that's the IP it's going to use forever. So if we actually do maintenance on our edge caches, then this thing goes down. Right? It can't reach the edge cache. It will never try to get a new IP. One thing we've done is that we actually upgraded to version 1.8, which is available from the, uh, it's like the SCL repo, um, which comes with it bunch of different things, but, um, and the DNS uh, reverse proxy works with it, although there's a lot of different things where you have to set up DNS resolvers and set up like different things to, to make it work properly. I've got a configuration of this, which I can review. But any question on this? It's fairly simple, right? So we have one of these in each market. So that's kind of how it looks like globally. Let's say like, well, you multiply this by, you know, by nine, if we have 18 markets, but that's what it looks like now. So in the future, right, of course I wanted to use Grove, and you'll see like, why, why is TFTP going to Grove? Well, that's because this little proxy that they created, TFTP to HTTP, it's written in Golang, so it looks like we could probably integrate it directly. I'm sure we don't want to do TFTP for CDN, but... Yeah, there's a plugin system. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why I kind of put this slide up there. It's like, if I've got somebody that can work on this, then something that we could actually do. So we could eliminate HA proxy and TFTP to HTTP altogether and just use Grove. Um, of course, that's what I'd like, but at this time, it's not. So here is the configuration for HA proxy. As you can see here, uh, you have to you have to define your resolver, right? These are IP address and ECAS that we use for DNS internally. Uh, and then we have also here uh, we have a few things that we're actually changing. One of the things, like actually changing the log format to match the traffic server logs, just like kind of what we've done with traffic router a little bit. And I do include a few uh, different header requests that I want to keep. By default, it wasn't keeping the user agent. And also, TFTP to HTTP has got a thing where it actually sets the header for X forwarded from. I don't know why. Documentation said for. This one's using from. And this is used to track the users inside the log. Because some, when somebody or when a cable model connects to the TFTP process, you know, uh, once it actually gets proxies, a uh, proxy to cross the CDN, then we lose the ability to see the IP address, and that provides dysfunctionality back to us. And then uh, the back end, that's the one here that uh, gets a little, uh, little weird. And of course, HA proxy doesn't support really well when there's no IPv6 that comes back, or it prefers IPv6. So I had to 
luckily, they had the setting for it to prefer IPv6. And the other thing is like you have to tell it to uh, send, send the, uh, the host header uh, back to the origin because it doesn't do it by default. It looks like it's not host header where there's a different like options for HTTP checks as well. But the, uh, the thing here is this server here. So I got to tell basically this HTTP send name header host. It's actually taking this name here, right, and sending it a host header. Then it reverse proxies to this one here with this ID one, and that's because I had to put two lines to make sure I've got a redundant one. So the ID one and two is just to separate both of them, but it's the same exact config line. So this, what it's gonna do is, in HAProxy, what it does is actually every 30 seconds, as I pull here, if it's valid, every 30 seconds, it pulls DNS every 30 seconds, and if the resultant A record, like the whole group is different, it's gonna change DNS entries. And that's the way to actually provide redundancy. And we came across in some markets where the difference between the primary and secondary um, uh, uh, response in DNS was different. And this thing was always cycling and cycling and cycling. So somehow I had to give up the secondary DNS for now, uh, just, in, just for that case. And uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit about a few things. Um, and uh, I mean, Rob is not here, but I guess John could answer a few things. So Grove, uh, so when the client connects HTTP to, um, to this, the, the HTTP server, like for example, for Grove or HTTPProxy, there's no host header. And I don't know if there's an option in Grove where we could actually enable that there's a default delivery service. So whatever, you don't match a host header, there would be a default uh, origin server, a different path that we could take. So this is something that would actually be required for to get the, uh, the Grove only uh, option. Uh, or if we can't do that, then we'll have to kind of keep HAProxy. And I want to put Grove in there. It's basically because I want an extra layer of caching. So right now, uh, you could accomplish uh, that effectively with the plugin. OK. All right. um, but it's something that we might consider. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. And uh, the second thing I came across is that the path from, let's say, HA proxy to Grove to traffic server, uh, the result of this was actually corrupted files. So once I removed Grove from the equation, the corruption issue went away. How outdated, how outdated are you? Sorry? How outdated are you with Grove? How current are you with Grove? The last time I tried it was probably like three months ago. We have our fixes in by that? We believe. We definitely had a problem where for example, in the linear case, serving up the wrong objects. Okay, nice. That might have been related to what you were Yeah, because the file size, the resultant file size was not the same with yeah, what was requested. Yeah. We try updating, yeah. Yeah, okay. But then I follow bug. <laughs> this is follow bug. Yeah, I know I, I know I discussed on the on the forum yeah. and, or on Slack about this, but and, yeah, I mean, it's a specific cases where, this I mean, it's happening in production. Okay, so I might have hit that then. Possibly. I'll give it a try. Probably. And uh, on the CDN side, um, I had this. I had to create two delivery servers for this. One that was actually for the Edge, like Edge.cmcdl, and I had to create another one that was like for Grove to manage Grove itself. Because uh, if I want to kind of proxy locally, I had uh, from TFTP to HTTP, then make sure it actually hits Grove locally. Uh, since the DNS uh, was not always local, uh, I had to create like two delivery services. That way I actually had to map 127.0.1 right back to the local proxy. But it's not optimal, but that's something. But then when I'm talking, like, oh, is it possible to have a third tier in the CDN? Flexible cache group thing should, I think, give you what you need there. And yeah. currently, you can have a third tier. Okay. We may or may not have three tiers in our CDN. Yeah. Okay. And the next thing, so for example, deep uh, the deep coverage, uh, the deep caching, for example, it goes directly from deep cache to the mid caches, right? And it doesn't go through edge caching. I mean, that's how it's configured. Yeah. All right. And then the second thing is that do you guys, I mean, the edge types, right? So when we actually define an edge, and of course in our Ansible dynamic inventory, what we do is that we group things by, you know, for example, edge. You know, and then it goes down the layer and it follows with the cache group. But then Grove has to have a type of edge. 
Is there something in traffic control where you can actually define different type of edges? Like well, edge grove and edge the ATS. Flexible cash groups gonna um, solve world hunger and fix all of these problems. <laughs> yeah, but I, mean, I think the answer to that question is yes already. Yeah, you okay. Edge something. Yeah. It still I mean, has to start with edge though. Yeah. Right, right. You said edge grove, edge ATS, edge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so how would you display that? Edge underscore something yes, or edge? That is currently how we may or may not have done it. Okay. Pretty sure. It has but, to start with the word edge. Yes. That. Yeah. Okay. We've got a lot of cruft in the code that basically does a regex. Does it start with mid underscore? Does it start with a edge underscore? Is it CCR or Rascal? Like these are old legacy cruft items that at some point someone's going to have to fix. All right. Okay. So, but these are uh, the thing that I had, and I do I have something else. Yeah. I mean, I had some additional information, and I think I kind of discussed them already. But um, yeah, and that's about it. I, I have, if you guys want to know how we're actually doing this anycast thing. It's basically defining the OpenStack VM, right, where we actually have this static IP and uh, using the Jennifer Contrail, you know, SDN, then we actually propagate this to the local market. So it's not like we're using BGP today to announce this so IP. Floating IP in the OpenStack world? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing that's not optimized is that we only have a single VM per market. So if this one goes down, of course, service is not available, right? <laughs> So explain a little bit the, uh, why, why? Why? Yeah. So, well, it's just to support HTTP for cable modem download, right? The owner of the service only had TFTP servers, and they could only like handle like 5,000 like a uh, firmware upgrade per day. And they wanted to move to HTTP to handle more software download per day. And what are they doing now? Well, they're supposed to be an upward of like 20,000 instead of 5,000, and they could do much more. I mean, I believe they could have probably upgrade the whole market if they wanted to, but you'd probably never do that. <laughs> and speed too, right? The cable download, cable mode download is taking a long time too, right? So, that, yeah, so that's another thing. Uh, we do have some type of set-top box that the file download, or the file size, like an upward of like a 30 megabytes or something, where it was maybe in the hundreds of megabytes. No, so like 70. So it would take like 30 minutes to download over TFTP. And that was a problem. So, oh, uh, yeah, that's uh, one last thing. This uh, traffic server active HTTP timeout, we ran across this as an issue where we had some of our, um, I guess, voice over IP and three over cable modem. And of course, these customers are only activated for voice. Well, their bit rate or their, their rate limit was actually set to 100 and something kilobits per second. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we were running this 900 seconds timeout, active timeout. I don't know why we have an active HTTP timeout, but um, what would happen is like the download would start, and in our logs we'd see at 900 seconds, right? It would stop. What'd you do? What'd you do? Changed Removed it. Well, yeah, obviously. But like, <laughs> why do you have 128K on your, don't you have a service network for your cable modems? And why should that be capped? So the default uh, classifier on the cable modem, or the default, um, not the classifier, but the uh, service flow, was set low. Because these customers, if they actually connect to the cable modem, they would go to a wall garden, for example. Right. But they could still do some, some things, right? So they could still download or upload, for example, for yeah. some services, yeah. So they tried to put the it's rate not limit. It's really a walled garden if you can get anywhere. I know, I know. So walled garden, I, I get that, but they still could generate traffic. So if you, even if you up the limit, they would still. I mean, somebody would have a bit blaster, and you know they could do some stuff. But then they're rate limited, right? Down to something that couldn't finish the download within 900 seconds. Yeah, it was kind of funny because like, all right, is this TFTP to HTTP that's the problem? Is this HA proxy? Then found out it's actually the CDN itself. So the cable modem download actually would go out a public interface on the cable modem? No, it's a it's a private IP. It's like a 10 IP, right? Confused. So the, the QoS is applied to both inter both sides of the cable modem. There's only well, there's only one side of the cable modem really for voice, right? It's the DOCSIS side, and then when you pick up the phone, it's just a jack, a telephone jack. But then yes, there's an Ethernet port, the bridge port that's actually on the cable modem that, that's there. That, Still active, right? Yeah. But that one is rate limited. It's that bridge. So, 
that's it. Any questions? All right.